the flowers in the amount that many of the ladies had on them, on their dresses and that sort of thing, it's difficult to visualise how they cope with them throughout the evening. Victorians loved to wear flowers about their person. It was the duty of the head gardener to ensure that suitable flowers were always available. Today, Harry gathers flowers for a grand musical evening the family are holding at their London residence. During the London season, fresh flowers were sent by train from the country estate up to town, a requirement that no doubt added to a head gardener's headaches. Tonight, these larkspur will decorate the family's London mansion, whilst other flowers from the walled garden will provide bouquets, corsages and garlands to adorn the dresses of the ladies. All had to be packed with the greatest care to ensure they arrived fresh and undamaged. We had one set of flower rampers here, uh, which uh, provided and supported a, a wickerwork tray, which fitted down into that. So you were able to put uh, pretty good substantial flowers in the bottom and your more delicate flowers in the top tray. So when you'd finished packing, the amper was really full and you was using it to the fullest. Once in London, the flowers were the responsibility of the lady's maid. The gardener's assistant had good advice for her. The floral headdress must be the very last arrangement to be attached. The longer it can be kept in its box, the better it will look at the end of the evening. But it wasn't just at night that the Victorian woman liked to bedeck herself with flowers. Presentation at court was an opportunity to wear a dress trimmed with eye-catching blooms. For Londoners, the procession to court was a great free show. The Illustrated London News described the barefooted beggar girl with violets for sale, the enthusiastic crowds straining to catch a glimpse of the glittering ladies, immersed in waves of satin, lace, feathers and flowers. See the amazing bouquets worn by the superb retainers in their manly bosoms. These flowers, exclaimed the excited reporter, refresh the ladies' jaded nerves on the journey with bright hues of hothouse floral vegetation, whilst on their way to perform the most serious duty of life. Before one such occasion, a lady to be presented to the Queen was sent a gift from her admirer to boost her morale. It was a bunch of the pale yellow Marachal Neal Rose. For the Victorians, yellow was a rare colour and this variety was a particular favourite. As she dressed for the great day, she attached to her gown a garland of the same fresh-cut roses. The lady was society beauty Mrs Lily Langtry and her admirer, the Prince of Wales. Through her fame and popularity, she made fashionable the flower that was to be forever associated with her name, the lily. When Japan opened its doors to foreigners in the 1860s, 
some truly spectacular lilies became available for the first time. It wasn't just the ladies for whom the head gardener had to prepare flowers. By the middle of the century, men were taking to wearing them. In 1874, domestic floriculture described these buttonhole bouquets and coat flowers as becoming very fashionable. The flowers were chosen for their staying power. It was a daily task of the gardener to identify and cut a suitable bloom. The Bourbon Rose, La Reine Victoria. One wants a nice tight bud and a variety that is going to stop in that bud reasonably for, say, six hours while it's uh, on the gentleman's buttonhole or whatever you're going to do it for. A small glass tube was often sewn into the gentleman's lapel to keep the flower fresh for as long as possible. Well, an ordinary simple buttonhole uh, could be made of one rose, or two roses, you had a variety then of material to put at the back of it. One of the uh, rose's leaves was quite nice and it was tied neatly round with a bit of thin bass or a bit of cotton. One particular well-known place I was at, the head journeyman or the foreman had to pick a red carnation and that had to go to the butler's pantry. And I'll never forget it, when there was a local sixpenny op, as we called it, on of a Friday night, uh, the aid, uh, housekeeper would send down and say that uh, the bus was leaving the courtyard at such and such a time. If any Bothy boys cared to go with the staff, they could go to the dance. And uh, if you went to the dance and uh, the uh, gentleman's valley uh, was able to get the time off to go as well, he was wearing his lordship's buttonhole at the dance. Of the many personalities who sported a daily buttonhole, none was more flamboyant and colourful than Joseph Chamberlain, MP for West Birmingham and father of the future Prime Minister. He was rarely pictured without one and his flower was nearly always an orchid. At Highbury, his large red brick house on the edge of Birmingham, Chamberlain relaxed and in between writing his notoriously long political speeches devoted himself to his other great love, growing orchids. His favourite was the Odontoglossum. Translated, that name means tooth and tongue, which perhaps appealed to his political instincts. Chamberlain had 13 glass houses devoted to orchids. He eagerly collected newly discovered species, but their rarity made it an attractive proposition to attempt to multiply them from seed. But any head gardener that took on that task was facing a few surprises. The first was how to pollinate the things. They're unlike any normal flower. In fact, you can't find the pollen or the stigma, but under here, there they are, 
in two little pollinia which can be pressed against the stigmatic surface which is hidden away inside there. Now if that's successful, pollination leads to fertilization and that means the developing seeds will be causing these pods to swell after a few weeks. And a year later, these wonderful sculptured fruits are ready to burst. If we take one off, and open it, the next surprise faces him because the seeds are in their hundreds of thousands and they are tiny. They're the smallest seeds of any flowering plant. And where to sow them? Well, the gardeners found that scattering the seeds around the mother plant was the way that worked the best. But then came the next surprise, because orchid seedlings are, of course, not like any other plant. There's no little stem and two leaves after two or three weeks. No, a year later, and all you've got are these minute blobs of tissue, really like a few cells, no roots, and hardly any leaves appearing. And it's not until 12 months after that that there's really recognizable little plants there. And in a further 12 months, they're just about big enough, well, to handle, to transplant. And it could be anything up to 10 years before those seedlings flower. Wealthy collectors got their orchids from nurserymen like James Veach. These horticultural entrepreneurs funded expeditions to search for new species and hired pistol-packing adventurers to lead them. In their travels, the plant hunters encountered adventures that were the very stuff of boys' own books. They hacked their way through near impenetrable jungles and waded thigh-deep in treacherous swamps. They kept their journeys secret, hoping to reach new plants ahead of their rivals. What they brought back astonished both botanists and gardeners. Orchid object is really a very ancient orchid pot. It's the design of a Bristol nurseryman, Alexander Moore, inspired perhaps by the chimneys of a nearby colliery. There's no denying that with its orchids in full bloom, the pot will provide a spectacular centerpiece for any soiree. I've got a cymbidium to place in the top. ferns, I would imagine, had to go in around the bottom. It was no good putting a pendulous plant and at the bottom of it, otherwise uh, it would be flowering uh, on the deck. 
these bits of fern should get away and uh, look quite nice in due course. Yes, I can well imagine how beautiful this must have been. How glorious those days must have been when one had plenty of time to to really fiddle and look after this sort of thing. Because, of course, one couldn't do a lot of uh, haphazard watering to such a thing as this. It had to be syringed daily and keep it natural moisture to it as if it was growing in the forest. Now, I think a cypripedium would be all right at that height. Mustn't call them cypripediums today, they're paphiopodiliums. But in my days they were known as sips. One journalist made his opinion of Mr. Maul's creation very clear. At first, these large pots have not a very inviting appearance, but by and by, as the plants grow, the pots get covered with vegetation, and this disagreeable appearance is done away with. Many flowers enjoyed passing popularity as a fashionable adornment, but it was always the rose to which ladies returned. One constant favourite was this deep red hybrid, General Jacques Minot. What, asked a Victorian romantic, would Napoleon's general have felt had he known that his fame would rest in the heart of a rose? and one so highly favoured by ladies with dark locks. Again, this single flower could be kept fresh by a tube of water concealed in the hair. But if your tresses were of a lighter hue, the choice was not always easy to make. So extreme was the fashion for floral trimmings that it became impossible to wear fresh flowers on every occasion. Many dresses were designed with artificial flowers made of wax, silk and a whole range of materials. Great care was taken to be as botanically accurate as possible. These hats on display at the Exeter Costume Museum give some idea of the detail and realism of fabric flowers. In some cases, real materials, like this lattice of twigs and dried leaves, are mixed with the artificial creations. Making sure their mistress looked her best for the great occasion required close collaboration between head gardener and lady's maid. The ideal flowers were not always available, but fortunately fashion allowed several styles of headdress. In selecting flowers, preference should be given, wrote the gardener's assistant, to those of a thick, fleshy character, since they look well out of water for the longest time. Ideal was Lapageria rosea. And Stephanotis, 
A gardener can do much towards a successful evening by selecting flowers that are not overblown and foliage that is not too young or soft. Finally, a lady's maid who takes pride in her work likes to see her mistress return from a party with her ornaments and decorations looking as fresh as at the beginning of the evening. I don't know whether the young lady would like to hear me say it or not, but I do think she was a bit of a fidget and uh, I don't think the flowers stood a chance on her at all. The flowers had to last upwards of six hours, which was quite a time for a flower in a warm room a lady dancing with a gentleman and uh, taking refreshments and sitting down in chairs and that it's, it's very, very difficult to visualise how some of those flowers came through the evening. We came through, and I'm very proud to have been part of that evening which really did belong to the past and nothing that I'd been privileged to take part in at any time before in my life.
In the high Victorian summer of 1870, few could have foreseen the winter ahead. Two great wars were to uproot the seemingly secure world of the head gardener. His walled garden became a place out of time. For a young journeyman like Harry Dodson, on the threshold of his career, the outbreak of war in 1939 was a moment of confused emotions. I knew that I would only have a very few weeks before I was gone, and uh, I did have many look arounds to, to see the plants that we'd looked after and to see the gardens, and it was really too sad for words. It, uh, it was quite stunning to know that it it had all got to go and what was going to happen. But it was great to go back and see some of the plants which had been kept and uh, the old hands that was left was telling you, well, we'll build them back up again when you come back. And, and we really thought that was going to happen sort of thing overnight, which uh, it didn't. And the pleasures of the Victorian flower garden are also recorded in a BBC book, which is now available. Mm -hmm.